Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Table for One, please. My name is Tommy Hensel, and I'm excited to have you back with me for my second video. This is episode number two, and this is the episode where we begin the cookbook challenge. Now, if you recall, if you saw my previous video, but if you didn't, I will fill you in a little bit. I decided that I was going to start at the left-hand side of the bookshelf where I had my 92 cookbooks, and one at a time, pick a book, in the order that they're on the shelf, read it, review it, and then randomly pick a page and cook a recipe or recipes from the book. So this particular installment of the cookbook challenge is my first cookbook review. It's the cookbook that was all the way over to the left-hand side of the bookshelf. So today we're starting the cookbook challenge with this dandy little book. It's called Casserole Magic. The subtitle is 300 Recipes for the Best in One Dish Meals. It was written by an author named Lucine Rousseau Bruner, uh, published in 1953, and on the back it sold for $3 in 1953, which I found out in 2019 money is about $28, so yeah, not a cheap cookbook. This is one of many cookbooks that I inherited from my grandmother. Now, she was born in 1898 and died in 2001, so during her lifetime, which spanned almost 103 years, she was a cook for over 80, probably 85 years of that. Now, her cookbook collection was not super extensive, but it did span many decades. So what we're going to find during the cookbook challenge is that a lot of the cookbooks I will be reviewing are what we would now call vintage cookbooks. Uh, this happens to be one of the more interesting of the vintage cookbooks that my grandmother had. Uh, the interesting thing about Lucine Rousseau Brunner is you can't really find much information about her online. I actually even went to Ancestry.com to see if I could do a little genealogy and I hit a blank wall. But what I did find out about her is that she did write a number of other cookbooks. So if you go to Goodreads or on Amazon.com and you search for her name, you will find that she wrote, in addition to this 1953 book, Casserole Magic, she wrote one called Magic with Leftovers in 1955, Casserole Treasury in 1964, the Summer Cookbook in 1966, The New Casserole Treasury in 1971, and then a redo of that one called The New Casserole Treasury in Color in 1977. So you kind of see from the titles of those books that she had a theme to her cooking passions. She loved casseroles. She loved working with leftovers. Um, so one of the things that you'll find in, probably in any of those other books, but you certainly find in this book, is her sort of passion for teaching people how to use inexpensive ingredients and how to use leftovers. So let's talk a little bit about casserole magic. What fascinated me about this is that when, I have to admit in full disclosure, when I first pulled it off the shelf and I saw this nifty little, um, which you can see this little um, drawing of the typical 1950s housewife in her crinoline dress and her perfect apron and her coiffed hair and high heels and there's probably pearls there somewhere. Uh, I thought, okay, this is going to be some kind of stereotypical casserole cookbook. And I grew up in the deep south and a lot of times when we think of casseroles, we think of something that always involves cream of mushroom soup. Uh, probably jello might be involved somehow in some of these preparations. So I kind of had a little bit of a, a rolling of your eyes kind of attitude. So I have to admit that when I started reading this cookbook, I was suitably chastised because this is a serious cookbook by a very talented, serious chef. Uh, I don't know what she did in her life or how she studied or where she learned, but this, this author really knew her stuff. So I have to tell you that as snarky as I may have felt about, oh, a 1950s cookbook, this is a pretty serious cookbook. Now, I am going to say that there are parts of it that are absolutely of the age where it was written. For instance, um, the author always refers to the cooks with a feminine gender. She calls them housewives and hostesses. Her assumption is that the audience for this book are typical American housewives who are cooking for their husband or their family or entertaining for guests. So there's actually a couple of really interesting um, quotes that I wanted to read you. Uh, oh, for all of you who are younger out there, reading glasses, you have something to look forward to when you get to be my age. So when she was writing about this, she writes about the advantages of casserole cooking. And this is what she says. The advantages of casserole cooking are almost too obvious to recount. 
Foremost among them, probably, is the fact that most casserole dishes can be prepared sometime in advance of mealtime, sometimes a whole day in advance. This leaves the housewife free for other last-minute chores, table setting, putting the children to bed, greeting guests calmly, or having a quiet cocktail with her husband while the casserole cooks. So clearly, we're talking about somebody who was speaking to a very specific audience. And there are a lot of cute little line drawings throughout the book, and many of them are line drawings of those housewives. Like I said earlier, with the crinoline dress and the perfect apron and the great hair and the pearls and the high heels holding a casserole dish. So there is a little bit of 50s stereotyping going on here. But the thing that I will tell you is that there's also something all the way on the other side, which I found really fascinating. There are a number of things that she talks about as being new and innovative um, that to us would be sort of second nature in the kitchen, but apparently in 1953 were not second nature in the kitchen. For instance, she talks about using herbs and spices as if it were some new and innovative thing. And in fact, the inside front and back covers have these great charts uh, for, about cooking with herbs. I'm going to show you a little bit. You can probably see if you look carefully at that. She has the herbs listed on one side and all these different types of food that you can use uh, the herbs on. So it's actually a pretty handy little reference that's still relevant today. So that's really interesting to me because to her, cooking with herbs was a new and innovative thing. Um, one of the things that I also found interesting about this book is that there are certain things that she talks about as if they were standard. For instance, about, I would say about 50% of the recipes in this book use bacon fat as an ingredient. So the assumption is that housewives in 1953 all had a ready supply of bacon fat in their kitchen, ready to go when they were preparing. And I laughed about that, but then I thought about it. When I was a kid growing up in the 60s and early 70s, my mother had this um, metal container on the back of the stove, and you took the top off of it, and it was a, a little thing that you poured bacon fat through, and so the fat would go through and the solids would stay on the top. You would dump those, and she had a ready supply of bacon fat. So apparently, bacon fat was a thing. You know? And I know a lot of friends out there who would be very excited to have that be a thing again. One of the things I found really interesting about this cookbook that sort of proved to me that she was a serious cook is that she said a few things that I just went, oh, yeah, amen to that. One thing she says here is, one simple principle has governed the preparation of this book. There is no excuse for dull or monotonous food. I could not agree more. One of the things she also says is, it is no part of the purpose of this book merely to shorten the process of food preparation. Prepared mixes and other shortcuts have their place, but they contribute little to making either cooking or eating a joy, and that is what it should be. So she's clearly somebody who takes cooking seriously and wrote this book because she really wants people to learn how to cook. And one of the things she talks about is that it's not about cheap cooking. It's about using many times inexpensive ingredients in innovative ways and maybe using leftovers. So she's trying to help with the sort of uh, money aspect of cooking. The thing that kind of sealed the deal for me that, that I said, you know what, I would love to have dinner with Lucy and Rousseau Bruner was this little quote about wine. Here she says, wine is a vital ingredient of some of the most appetizing casserole dishes and its use adds distinction to all kinds of otherwise plain dishes. Of course, the alcohol in it evaporates almost at once and only the flavor remains. For superb results, you do not need the fine table wines. Good domestic wines are perfect for the purpose, but they must be good. You can't make a good dish with a poor wine. And I could not agree more. Oh, and speaking of wine, let me take a little sip. One of the things uh, that stood out to me in this book was another thing that for her was an innovative thing, which made me kind of cringe. She has a whole paragraph or two where she talks about the joys of this new, exciting ingredient called monosodium glutamate that sometimes is sold as accent that is a boon to housewives in the kitchen because it will transform your cooking. Well, I have to admit, I am not a fan of MSG, but I guess in 1953, it was kind of a new thing. You know, so there you go. Um, when we think about casseroles, this was probably the most interesting thing to me at the beginning of this book, more than almost anything else, is that she talks about the history of casseroles. And many times we think of casseroles as these oblong Pyrex dishes, or maybe round, 
that you throw in the oven, but she's using a much more inclusive concept. So she's thinking about all of those dishes that have been around for thousands of years in other cultures besides the United States, uh, those, those ceramic or earthenware pots that go on the stove that you can cook the entire meal in one pot, uh, much like a Dutch oven. And she does reference Dutch ovens. So she's talking about not just the types of traditional oblong or round casseroles that you put the stuff together and you stick it in the oven and it's done, uh, but also the kind of one dish meals that you cook on the stove top uh, and maybe sometimes take from the stove top and then put into the oven, but it's all in one dish. And that's really the sort of focus of this book is everything. Um, you may have multiple pans and pots and things that you're preparing pieces in, but when you assemble it all, it's in one dish or one pot and it's cooked in that one dish or one pot. And in many cases, she suggests serving it in that same thing. So it's all about the simplicity of one dish meals. So I think it's a really cool cookbook. She divides the cookbook up into seven sections. There's a section on meat that includes beef, chicken, veal, fish, and shellfish. And then she has um, a section on uh, vegetables. She has a section on one dish, one pot meals. There are things like lasagna and beef stew and things like that. She has a section on grains and cereals and eggs. So there's a whole bunch of different sections. And the sort of common theme, of course, is um, not super complex, not a huge number of ingredients most of the time, but just put together in inventive ways. One of the things that's great about probably about 80% of the cookbook before you get to the vegetable dishes is that for every one of those one pot dishes, whether it's a meat or a chicken or a seafood uh, or shellfish or whatever it happens to be, she always suggests sides. So for instance, let's just pick a random page. Um, so veal casserole with sour cream is one of the recipes. And she has the long recipe and at the end she says, serve with buttered noodles and buttered asparagus. Next to it is um, veal balls with sour cream. And at the end, it says, serve with buttered noodles and chopped spinach to which a few sliced and sauteed mushrooms are added. So for each dish, she suggests what the side dishes should be. And many times the side dishes are surprisingly healthy things like a green salad with chicory and endive, you know, things like that, that I found myself going, yeah, that's actually pretty cool. I mean, like many cookbooks of this era and many cookbooks even now, uh, it does rely rather heavily on starch as a side dish. There's a lot of side dishes that she mentions that are potatoes and sweet potatoes and rice and buttered noodles and things like that. But she does make a point at one point of saying, if your family's not addicted to starch, you could have this one dish all by itself without anything or use this vegetable as a side dish. So I found that really um, very, very interesting. Um, when we got to the, you know, I was actually enjoying the book a great deal. And we got to the, the, um, the vegetable portion. And I have to admit, when I got to the vegetable portion, I was absolutely taken aback by something. So she talks about first, really kind of best practices of cooking vegetables. Don't boil them in a whole lot of water, but boil them in only just enough water and until they're just done. So she's a real advocate of the idea of not overcooking vegetables. But then she put this really fascinating paragraph in. And I challenge anybody who watches this video to please let me know, have you ever heard of this. So she says, um, a new method of waterless cooking, which can be done in any kettle, produces vegetables that are a miracle of tenderness. The method is simple, but takes a little longer than boiling. In any kettle at all, melt one tablespoon of margarine or butter for every two portions of vegetable. If the vegetables are large, such as potatoes, beets, onions, and carrots of good size, cut them in segments. Slice cabbage thin or chop it. Put vegetables in the kettle Add about one half teaspoon of salt and a little less of sugar for two portions. Stir well to coat with fat and seasoning. Get this. Lay over the top a single layer of lettuce leaves. Cover tightly and cook without stirring over very low heat about 20 minutes. Any kind of lettuce will do and the tough outside leaves can be used. This method is for fresh vegetables only. I have never heard of this preparation. And I looked at it and thought, didn't they have steamer baskets? But maybe in 1953, the concept of steaming vegetables was not a thing. But this would steam them. If you think about it, the lettuce leaves have a lot of moisture in them. 
So as they're slow cooking the vegetables, the vegetables will release moisture themselves and the lettuce leaves will release moisture and they'll kind of steam. I just thought that was fascinating. So I'm, no matter what recipe we randomly choose today, I'm going to have to try that. So clearly you can tell I really liked this cookbook. Lucine Rousseau Bruner, whoever she was and wherever she studied, was a serious cook. She writes in a very dry, understated, uh, sort of humorous way. I can't tell you how many times there are recipes that involve wine or Madeira or sherry or rum where she makes a point of saying in every single instance, you can substitute X, Y, or Z for this, but it won't be as good, so don't do it. So she's very clear about the fact that what she's putting here as the ingredients are the ones you should use. Uh, whether you drink alcohol or not, the alcohol burns off, but you get a better flavor with it. So, you know, I, um, I'm kind of in her camp on this. So I'm excited by uh, this whole project, but I actually am excited that this was the first cookbook because it surprised me. I absolutely did not think I would like this cookbook. I was prepared to pan it. I was prepared to make fun of it, and I have to just eat some crow, which luckily is not a recipe in here, uh, and tell you I love this cookbook. Now, uh, surprisingly, well, or not, I think you can find anything in the world on Amazon.com. You can find this book on Amazon. Uh, if you go to my blog at tableforoneplease.com and look at the review that I've written of this cookbook, I've linked back to Amazon so you can actually click through, and I would say buy a copy. It's a lot of fun. Uh, yes, there are some, you know, stereotypical housewife from the 50s kind of moments in here, but get past that. Uh, there's some great things in here. And for instance, she goes into great de detail about how to make a perfect souffle, uh, which, you know, many cookbooks do, but I really thought her sort of method was very simple to follow and easy. So there's a lot of things like how's the best way to brown meat? What are some of the best side dishes for certain types of meats? On and on. There's a lot of handy tips and tricks in here that still hold up today. So I highly recommend this book. So now we're moving to the exciting part of the evening. Um, we're going to randomly pick a recipe. So I have set up my iPad by putting pages three to 175 in there. I'm not sure if you can see that because it's kind of bright, but we're gonna random number generator to see what page I'm gonna prepare a recipe from. So random number generation, so you know I'm not cheating. It went to page 89. Let's see what's on page 89. Oh, I lost my glasses. All right, so 89, 89, we can remember 89. All right, casserole magic. Here we go, 85. Oh, we're in the seafood area. All right, so we have two recipes on page 89. Tuna fish with noodles. I don't know if I'm gonna be liking this or not. And tuna pie. So we get to choose, or I get to choose, which one of these two recipes I'm gonna cook. And what's really fascinating is this is these are two of the only recipes in this book that do not use fresh raw ingredients. They actually call for canned tuna. But I promised that I would randomize, so we're gonna do tuna pie. But I think um, I'm gonna give myself an additional challenge because I'm kind of cool with adding one of their uh, vegetable recipes. So the vegetable recipes start on page 129, no, 130, and go to 175. So I'm going to put in 130 to 175. All right. Oops. 130 to 175. And there it is. We're going to generate. Did it work? Hmm. Well, technology is not my. Oh, yeah, it did. 161. All right, so let's see what vegetable I'm going to use with the whichever of the tuna recipes I use. So, 
61. Ooh, it moved into the eggs and cereals portion. Ooh, so um, a quick cheese souffle or a baked cheese sandwich souffle. I think to pair with the tuna, we're going to go with the cheese souffle. So this is kind of a, a, a shortcut to make a quick cheese souffle. So we're going to make one of the tuna recipes and the quick cheese souffle. So my next video is going to be me in the kitchen doing my darned best to cook those two recipes for you. So thank you for joining me. I know this was a long video, but I appreciate you sticking with me. And now, as always, I am epicuriously yours. Cheers.